Now to the war in Gaza, where Israeli forces claim Hamas strongholds in the north of the Gaza Strip are on the brink of collapse. Israel Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told reporters hundreds of Hamas operatives have surrendered in recent days, many claiming to be without food or weapons. Meanwhile, Hamas has warned it will not release any more hostages until its prisoner release demands are met. For more on all this, I'm joined by former Israeli ambassador to Australia, Mark Sofer. Mark Sofer, thank you for coming to us live from Tel Aviv here tonight. Um, Mark, just got to ask you, first of all, how are you going in Tel Aviv and what's the mood in Israel right now? Well, the mood is uh, really as it was, uh, uh, still really from a, in a state of shock, uh, horror and revulsion of the, the uh, tragedy that uh, was inflicted upon us on the 7th of October on the one hand, and yet resilience uh, and resolve and determination that uh, not only will this never happen again, but that the Hamas will be uh, decimated to such an extent but it will not rule in uh, Gaza anymore, on the one hand, but also will not have any military capability of launching any type of attack on Israel in the future as well. So it's two sides, really, of, of an issue. Uh, but still, the sorrow, the anger, the the hurt, the, the tragedy, the catastrophe that was inflicted upon us is uh, very, very, very far from being uh, forgotten at all. Sure, of course, and we all understand that. But the IDF now says that it's on the verge of dismantling Hamas battalions in at least the north. What does this mean now strategically? And are we getting to a point now where we could see Hamas finally, I don't know, would they be crushed? Would they surrender? What would that look like? What would that end game start to look like? Well, the decimation of Hamas in the north of uh, Gaza is one thing, and it's uh, about to be completely achieved. The problem uh, still exists of uh, Hamas in the south, uh, of course, and uh, there we are in, uh, daily encountering uh, 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 battalions of Hamas terrorists, uh, all of them actually, uh, under underground. You know, it's been discovered in the last uh, uh, weeks that uh, uh, there is a greater tunnel uh, um, operation underground than there is, in, in fact, of the London underground. Uh, over 500 kilometers of uh, tunnels they've built a city, a, a, a state under a state, under a Gaza. So we find ourselves really in a very, very difficult situation of uh, up, uh, uprooting and uh, bringing them out of their tunnel systems. Uh, of course, it costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to build such a tunnel system inside a, uh, of a built-up area, money which could and, of course, should have been used for welfare, for schooling, for education, for uh, health care, and you name it. Mm. Uh, but no, the Hamas took the money and used it uh, basically to build up a military infrastructure underground. Yeah, well, it's shocking that. But when now, if you've got all of these people living under underground now, um, once you've got control over the, over the ground level, the surface level, though, will the IDF be able to essentially starve them out? They won't have any water. They won't have any food. They're going to have to start to come out eventually, won't they? Well, one of the problems that we face, uh, which is uppermost in our mind, is the issue of the hostages. There's still over 130, maybe 137 hostages still uh, in captivity, probably being held underground as well. So these are issues that we have to deal with one at the same time. It's not only a question of starving them out. They may probably have stockpiled food there for goodness knows how long. They've certainly stolen it from the aid trucks that have come in. Come in. So, yes, we will have to uh, deal with the underground tunnels. We have been dealing with them. We, uh, we've uh, uh, over 700 of them have already been destroyed in the north and in parts of the south. But now we have to deal with the rest. And uh, there's still some time, unfortunately, for this war to go on. I wish it would end tomorrow. And it could end tomorrow, uh, were the Hamas to surrender immediately and give up the hostages. But they don't seem to be doing that. And so uh, we will continue until we've uh, decimated them completely. I mean, as a matter of diplomacy, uh, do you find it just bizarre that so many people in the West, you know, call on uh, Israel to... Uh, participate in a ceasefire, but Hamas could have a ceasefire in the next hour if they just simply declared all of their hostages would be released and they were going to stop, right? Well, it's more than bizarre, but, it's, uh, but it fits in very well with the narrative of uh, what we saw even before Israel had uh, uh, reacted to the horror and the tragedy and the uh, uh, despicable savagery of Hamas on the 7th of October, when even on that same evening, including in Australia, I must say, sadly, mm. uh, uh, people were out in the streets screaming, uh, burn the Jews, uh, destroy Israel, etc. This is part of a narrative which... Uh, exists among extremists, something we've had to deal with all our existence uh, since 48, and in fact, earlier. 
Uh, and so we're pretty much used to it. But the fact of the matter is this is a just war. This is a war to ensure that such a, uh, a, a, a tragedy and such a horror never is inflicted upon us again. Uh, and we will continue. And is there a problem, though, then, you know, we see these boycotts and uh, other social media campaigns against businesses that are linked to Israel or even just have Jewish owners, which, of course, has horrible echoes of 1930s Germany. Um, but within the era of social media, do those messages then come back and wind up tipping the conflict in one way or the other or give some sort of false support to Hamas, thanks to, I guess there's no other word for it, but useful idiots in the West uh, who decide that they want to support these guys? Well, I think, James, calling them useful idiots is a nice way of calling them. Uh, people who boycott Jews, as you said earlier, is analogous to the worst times of uh, history in the last century, on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, it's anti-Semitism in its purest form. It also bolsters, and this is very important indeed, the truism that we've always known, the fact that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are two sides of the same coin. In other words, you attack Jews when you hate Israel. Uh, which clearly uh, for, is one and the same thing uh, uh, in their minds and in the minds of any anti-Zionist. So, uh, yes, this is pure and simple anti-Semitism anti on the one hand. On the other, no, it doesn't affect our economy in any way whatsoever, but it does affect and it may affect those of the Jewish community, not only in Australia, but throughout the world. But again, uh, the community is united, uh, the Jewish community throughout the throughout the international arena is united with Israel on this, except for a few exceptions on the extremes. Uh, and yet, uh, incidentally, so is Israel. And this is a very rare uh, uh, cause, because in Israel, we are very much divided. We are very much split on a number of issues, as you know. Mm. Uh, but on this particular issue, we are uh, completely and utterly unified and united. Mark Sofer, thank you so much for joining me tonight on Credilid.